welcome to my podcast, Knows What You Read in the Dark, a book club podcast made by chaotic people for chaotic people. I'm Kristen. I'm Lady. I'm B. And I'm Caitlin. And we are four friends here to tell you what's what about the books we read and love this month or the books that we hated this month. I had a question. I saw something earlier today, um, or was it yesterday? I don't remember, but it made me want to ask you guys, and that is... If you could pick like three books that would describe you and your taste in reading, what would those books be? You're just trying to expose us. Yes. Right. Indeed. You're going to make me call my own self out on this public podcast. I want to pull back the layers. Yeah. Like an onion because I'm an ogre. He's like, your name is Shrek. What are you doing in my swamp? <laughs> <laughs> I have to think about this. I don't want to answer this question, Kristen. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I have two. I need a third one. I do. I have two, and I can't quite think of a third. Yeah, I have two. Hold on. I'm looking at my log on StoryGraph to see what's on there that might catch my eye. I can't only pick three. Yeah. No, I've got it. Okay, I've got it. Okay. And I'm, like, trying to pick books that, like, encompass the range of taste. Me too, but they all have, like, problematic elements, so it's perfect. Oh, I mean, yeah. But who cares? If people come to this podcast and don't know that we're going to be talking about problematic shit, I know. they're not welcome here. Exactly. Like, get out. We don't want you. Yeah. I'm sure there's another book podcast that you can listen to. There's so many of them. Yeah. yeah. Like, come on. We're a dime a dozen. Go listen to somebody who is concerned about moral purity. You're not going to find that here. Go listen to a, a Quarter of Thorns and Roses podcast. <clears throat> Actually, well, even, even then, yeah, pretty problematic. Yeah. 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 Love these problematic books. Just say you hate fun and then leave. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. We all ready? Yeah. Sure. So who wants to go first? I'll go first. My first two were pretty easy. The third one, I needed to find some smut to put in there. <laughs> so my three books That's like are... my answer. <laughs> I know, right? So my three books are How the King of Elfame Learned to Hate Story by Stories by Holly Black, Alice by Patrick Senecal, and Feast of Sparks by Sierra Simone. Ooh. <laughs> You picked Feast of Sparks. <laughs> yes, it's so good. It's the angst. It's the pining. I know, it's, it's the angstiest one. What was the second one that you said? Alice by Patrick Senecal. It's a Alice in Wonderland retelling that is extremely raunchy and extremely gross. Ooh. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go next. So, um, the first I would say would probably be something like The Cruel Prince by Holly Black, or, or really like the modern fairy tales from Holly Black, but but something where it's like mixing. F like folklore and a modern setting especially or just uh, just kind of bringing folklore in and interactions with humans um i just really like those kinds of books especially when they're done really well and then i this is another one from holly black you shouldn't be surprised but <laughs> the darkest part of the forest but not necessarily because of the weaving of folklore but i am a sucker for the ya novels that really have that inner monologue that really fits with high schoolers. Yes. And then the other one, because I also needed to like throw in some smut. Um, there's this old school, this is like totally outing me, but like from our last episode when we were talking about books we read in middle school, like I kept mentioning books from elementary school because I was reading like smut in middle school because they were around my house and I was like, let's read I mean, this hell book. Yeah. <laughs> so one of like my probably my earliest smut book that i read was this book called the dark queen uh, i cannot remember the author right now oh my god i think i know what you're talking about yeah hold on let me so it's the dark queen by susan carroll it's basically uh you know a, a, a fictional main character but it also involves historical fiction of real characters and so the dark queen in this case is catherine de medici um, who ends up being queen of france it it has again like layering of like some kind of historical aspect to it also really good narration from the main character but then also you know smut that's what we love to see <laughs> so, those are my three <laughs> so for me surprising no one the first one is the night circus by aaron morgenstern because any <laughs> of kind of book that is weird whimsical non-linear makes you question what's going on the whole time that is absolutely my shit like The Night Circus, Mr. Pernumba's 24-Hour Bookstore, The Book of Speculation, The Bedlam Stacks, uh, The Watchmaker Filigree Street. They hit, they tick every box for me. Uh, A Natural History of Dragons by Marie yes. Brennan. Love those books. 
They're like a kind of alternate history dragon fantasy that just, again, checks every box for me. Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. I uh, love weird ass science. I love when science has gotten really fucked up or when we're trying to understand things and like the science is really weird and like doesn't play by the rules we know it to play by. And then I did four because I can't follow the rules and I could not I could not leave it off the list. And that would be Prince's Gambit by C.S. Picard because yes, yes, no yes, book, yes. no book fucking wallows in that tension so sweetly and so well like Prince's Gambit does. You're so right. My God, that payoff is incredible. Oh, it is. It's amazing. Kristen, what's yours? So, um, I've got, um, obviously, if we were villains by M.L. Rio, anything yes, like course. Dark Academia, anything, um, you know, I don't want to say murder mystery, but like thriller elements and death and darkness. I, I love all of it. Um, and then, on the complete other side of the spectrum, I have The Heiress Gets a Duke by Harper St. George. Um, I am like a sucker for Regency romance, historical romance. I'm all about it. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's my deep, um, love of Pride and Prejudice that keeps me coming back to these books. I get to relive it over and over and over. And then A Deal with the Elf King by Elise Kova. Ooh. Uh, if, there's a bunch of them in this, in this series. Um, there's A Dance with the Fae Prince and A Duke with the Vampire Lord. There's another one coming out this year. Um, A Duet with the Siren Duke. I love all of those books. And just in general, like, they have a trope that I really enjoy, which is like forced marriage, not marriage of yes. convenience, but like arranged forced marriage. I love that trope in books. Yep. Every time. Yeah. Especially, with the fantasy elements, like, put in, love it, chef's kiss, every single time. And when it's inner species, that just mm, hits. Beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. Gives it that umami flavor. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So, lady, uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your book? Yeah, this month I was given two books, both of which sounded amazing. But since I knew I would have very limited time to read... I decided to opt for the shortest one of them. And so I picked up The Bees by Laline Paul. The Bees is a speculative fiction book set inside of a beehive. It follows Flora 717 as she emerges from her pupae as a sanitation bee. So she, sanitation bees, they're the bottom of the hierarchy. There's like, they're, they're a subclass of like the workers. And what they do is basically they clean the hive. Like whenever someone, like whenever a new bee emerges, they clean out the poop, they make the, thing ready for like another bee to go in and they take out the dead and stuff like that most of them can't speak but flora can so this immediately gets the attention of one of the high priestesses and the high priestess sends flora to do different other tasks around the hive it's a really strange book and so my opinions is probably going to be all over the place but like bear with me <laughs> so now our, our listeners at home might not know me as well as my fellow hosts I have a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology. I took every single entomology class that my university offered, and I worked with insects for a little while after I graduated. So needless to say that this book should rate as A for absolutely my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it did, honestly. So I have to say that this book humbled me. There's a small part of me, like the little goblin that lives inside of me, that I try to shove away, who is kind of like a hipster. So when I saw that, before I started reading the book, or after I started like a few chapters, I read the reviews and people were like, oh, this book's a little bit too long, this book's a mess. And I thought, oh, well, maybe this is just isn't for them. But after I started reading it, and like, admittedly, I skimmed through the most of the last 50% of it, I really wonder who this book is for. My knowledge of bees isn't perfect, but I saw some reviews who were talking about how it's not accurate, it's like not real, it's too anthropomorphized. And I'm here to say these people are insane, that's not true. <laughs> this book is actually pretty, from, from my imperfect knowledge, is pretty scientifically accurate. It's full of like cool little details about bees. So like, for example, at one point, Flora gets sent out as a forager. And the foragers, when they come back to the hive, they will dance and show the location of flowers and like other information that others need to know, which is actually a thing that bees do. Hmm. In the nursery, the workers, like the nurses, they produce flow, which is like this 
fantasy equivalent of basically royal jelly that they feed the larvae. And the coolest thing, I think, was at one point a wasp attacked the hive and basically the bees created a heat ball around it, which is when they just like all surround the attacker and they just like move their wings and stuff to like overheat the the creature that, that they've surrounded until it dies. The most badass defense mechanism nature has yet produced. It's it's really cool. I remember reading about this with like there was rumor of like a Japanese wasp or something like yeah. invasive species hitting America and like basically talking about like how honeybees can kill that wasp. Yeah. The coolest Very shit. Very cool, yeah. But yeah, my problem with this though is that if you know anything about how I'm an Opteran society's fun- function, then you will see the conflict slash plot coming from a uh, from a mile away. Mm. At about thirty percent of this book, I was ready for it to end. So like, oh yeah, it's it's rough. Like I was enjoying it, but then at one point I was like, oh, am I only thirty percent in? Like, how are we not near the plot, the the, the twist yet? Like. Mm. So there are a lot of rules that the bees must follow, and they're enforced through chemicals released by the queen and transmitted through the hive. It's presented kind of like a cult, with only like the priestesses allowed to have access to the most secret knowledge. The workers, aka the females, are meant to accept, obey, uh, obey and serve, and they repeat that motto quite a lot, like whenever the priestesses are trying to get them in line, they're just going to be- basically start saying, like, accept, obey, and serve, and the, wo- the workers are going to reply the same thing. The drones, so the males, they're worship, and they only exist to find queens from other hives to fuck and create new colonies. And then you have the queen who is only accessible to a select few that are kind of like, basically ladies in waiting. Hmm. At one point, Flora gets to see, like, the, the, the back of this, like, this part of the hive, basically, and she gets to, like, live a little bit in that world, but, like, you can clearly see it's completely different from how she lives as a sanitation bee or a forager or whatever she is at that moment. And the number one rule is that only the queen is allowed to reproduce. And as Flora gets sent to the nursery to work, she witnesses the f- the fertility police kill a larvae and eat it in front of her because it wasn't one of the queen's eggs, which is pretty brutal, you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. ew. Despite this, she, she still wants a baby, and it happens. And if you don't know, like worker bees can actually lay eggs without fertilization, which will develop into a male baby. It's only when the eggs are fertilized that the egg develops into a female, which is usually done only by the queen because she's usually the only one who reproduces, or who um, who mates with males. Still, like in real bee societies, the queen does not take well to ro- workers reproducing, and then the offsprings are killed. Uh, and that's because any female egg can actually actually develop into a queen. Queens are just like regular female larvae that have been fed for longer. With just this basic information about bees, which is like a thing that you know if you know anything about bees, uh, you know where the, where this book is going. So I guess this twist about like 10% into the book, when like at one point she was in the nursery and someone was like, she doesn't know the truth about feeding, right? And I was like, okay, this is where this book is going. <laughs> yeah. When Flora laid her first egg, I was already ready for like that twist and like for basically ready for the book to be over, or at least like the, for that plot line to continue. But then it kept going. So her first mm-hmm. egg got eaten or destroyed, and then the second one got destroyed. And I was like, okay, at this point, I get it. Like, mm-hmm. I, I know where this is going. But then she gets told, like, oh, you're going to actually lay another egg, like as some kind of like weird prophecy, whatever. And yeah, the she sure enough, she lays a third egg and she takes a little bit more care of it and it survived. And it turns out that her baby's a female. That's when she realizes what, basically what will create a queen. And so she feeds her baby longer and then her egg develops into a... Pro- like, I'm basically spoiling the book, but at the same time, like, as I said, if you know bees, you just know where this book is going. So... Yeah, her f- mysteriously female offspring develops into a potential queen. I don't know why the baby is female. I have no idea. Magic. <laughs> yeah, she did yeah. not mate with a male as far as I can tell. Uh, granted, I did skim a lot of the f- last 50% of the book, but I did not see anything that would make it so that she would have mated. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
this book was fun for a little bit, but like it's a I think three hundred and something pages book, and I'm like at this point Jesus I would have Christ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I I would have preferred it to be like a short story or something. Yeah. And for something for a book where the main character is basically. She's not born at the beginning, but she's basically an adult. Like, she emerges as an adult at the beginning. She knows nothing. It takes way too long for you to actually understand how all of these kins and different, like, hierarchies work. Yeah. You could, it should have been easy to teach the reader how this world works. Instead, it takes, like, 25% before you actually understand what's going, like, who That's all of these too people much. are. That's and way yeah. too much for world building. That was The Bees by Lillian Paul. Wow. <laughs> we didn't need a timer. Yeah. No, we didn't. Who gave Lady her book? It was me. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so when I was trying to figure out what book I wanted to recommend to you, I had had that book on my to-read list, I think, since I was in high school, like a real for a really, really long time. And I remember a friend of mine reading him basically being like, it was kind of weird, but I really liked it. And she's also like big into bugs. So I was like, that one was on the, the back of my radar. And the other book that I recommended, it was Strange the Dreamer, right? Yes. That book I fucking loved. I read that book myself and read that one. And I honestly was like, man, I kind of just want to recommend this. But I did have the same thought of as you where I was like, this is kind of long, though. And I don't necessarily want to give her a really long book to read. Yeah, I think I asked for something under 400 pages, like a around 400 yes. pages, and Stranger Dreamer was like 500 plus pages, and I just yes. knew I did, with all of the books of the month for We're in Page Library in March, I didn't, I wouldn't have time to, uh, to yeah. read Stranger Dreamer, but I have taken a hold out of the library for it. I think you will really like yes, that Yes, I book. think so too. Um, I am, I've been in the process of listening to the audiobook for the second book the second book, uh, Muse of Nightmares, for uh, a long time. But that's just because I've, like, picked it up and kind of fallen off reading completely, and then it has fallen to the back burner because I need to refresh my memory. But I really like both of those books. Like, the concept is really cool and the world building is cool. So I hope you read those two, but... I will. And honestly, I'm, I am glad that I read The Bees. It's just, I kind of wish it was shorter. <laughs> yeah. At one point, Flora is just going out and like doing different like outings in the world and like collecting pollen and nectar. And I was just like, okay, I get it. <laughs> there could have been less of this. Yeah. 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 It sounds like more of a book that should have been a novella. Exactly. Yeah. That's how I feel with A Court of Wings and Ruin, where they have like so many trips back to the prison. I'm like, there could have been like three less of these. Yeah. We yeah. didn't have to do that every yes. time. Like this book is like what, almost 700 something pages. We do not need these many trips back to the bone carver. Let's wrap it the fuck up. Exactly. But see, for that, it didn't bother me because there were characters to love and, like, you get attached to them. Yeah. By the fact that this book is about bees, you can't relate to the characters. Yeah, yeah that's there was, true. There was one character that I really liked to see over and over again in the bees, but, like, just because he was a pathetic little guy, like... Of this, course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, there's just, like, this pathetic, like, kind of, like, runty-looking drone bee that was like, oh my god, he's back, yay, I love him. At one point, he's dead, and I'm just like, oh, well. From your description, the one thing I, I do kind of like is it doesn't sound like she pulled any punches with some of the weird shit, like the, the oh, fertility no, it's really... police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's brutal. I think I, I posted it at one point in one of my, in our, in our Discord, where there's a bit where... At one point, they just decide to kill all the males. Mm -hmm. Like, the workers just basically rise up and kill all the males. I remember you commenting this. Yeah. One of the workers basically just tears this dude's dick off and eats it. Nice. I get the impulse. You go, queen. Yeah. Go off, queen. We've all been there. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Kristen, what do you got for us? Okay. So, my book was Laertes by Carly Stevens. Um, and it's a Hamlet retelling told from the perspective of Laertes. Um, and so before we get into this book, I want to briefly touch on the plot of Hamlet for anyone who either doesn't remember or hasn't read it. Um, because instead of talking about the plot um, of a book that's, you know, it's basically just being retold to you, I want to spend more time talking about the other parts of the book that what and what made it really good instead of hammering out like plot details. 
Um, and so for anyone who doesn't know, the original plot of Hamlet is that Hamlet's father, who is the king of Denmark, comes to him as a ghost and tells Hamlet that he needs to avenge his murder by killing the new king, which is Hamlet's uncle Claudius. Um, and he just recently married Hamlet's mother, who is the queen, and he killed the king of Denmark. And so in his attempt to gain revenge, Hamlet um, starts to feign madness. Um, and then we learn that Ophelia, who is Laertes' sister, is pursuing Hamlet and they seem to have some sort of relationship. But Laertes tells her, you know, not to pursue him and he's about to leave for France. And so, you know, he just says before he leaves, you know, please do not pursue, pursue this relationship with him. And so in Hamlet's madness, he ends up actually rejecting Ophelia. And then later on, um, Polonius, who is the royal attendant to the king and Laertes' father, is speaking to the queen in her private rooms because in an attempt to hide from Hamlet in like one of his madness episodes. Um, and during this exchange, Hamlet ends up coming into the room and Polonius hides, but ends up catching Hamlet's attention and thinking that he's the king, Hamlet stabs him through the curtain and kills him. And so after, you know, this rejection of Hamlet and the death of her father, Ophelia ends up going mad herself and drowns. And so naturally, all this comes to a head. Laertes is freaking pissed at Hamlet because <laughs> he learns, you know, that like his Putting father was killed by Hamlet. And then he also kind of indirectly caused the death of his sister. Um, and so he challenges Hamlet to a duel. Um, Laertes and the king arrange to have Hamlet killed by a poison rapier or wine during the duel depending on the outcome so like if if uh if laertes loses the duel you know he can give him the wine and hamlet will drink from him and die but the plan kind of goes awry um and the queen ends up drinking from the wine and dies and so then like in a fit of rage hamlet and laertes um brawl and they both end up wounded by the poison blade and they both die, but not before Hamlet finally kills the king at the end of the play. Um, and so the original play doesn't really go into Laertes' backstory too much because it isn't really needed. You don't need his backstory to understand what's being told about Hamlet. Um, but this book goes heavily into his backstory and it kind of makes it a little bit more... I'm going to say well-rounded. I don't know if that's the best phrase, but you get to see inside Laertes' head as he's navigating this time, um, even before the death of the king. Um, and you learn a little bit more about his relationship with Hamlet. And then you also get to look at, you know, what's going through his head before his father and sister die, as well as after um, his struggle with justice and vengeance. It feels really complex and it should feel that way. You kind of start to question whether revenge is always justified. So anyway, this book actually takes place in Paris in the 1920s. Um, uh, Laertes lives in Paris most of the time. Um, he's studying classics and lives with two other boys who end up playing the same roles as Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who are two... I don't want to call them friends, but in the original story, they are brought to Denmark by the king to distract Hamlet from his madness as they were childhood friends. But in the original play, those two were more, um, they weren't really friends of Hamlet. They were actually spies for the king. But in Laertes, these two friends that take this place, um, their names are Julian and Henry. They are Laertes' true friends. It's not something that's kind of hidden. They're not spies for anybody. Like, they're actually his friends. Um, and so I like the his dynamic with those two a lot in this book. It's not just, like, the main people that you know. You get new people in the story as well. And I kind of really like that. The last half of the book really deals with madness and grief and how it parallels Hamlet um, in the original story. So um, in the play, Hamlet is feigning, is actually feigning madness. But in the book, Laertes isn't. He is going completely insane as his world is starting to fall apart you know, through the plot of this book. And so yeah. we end up learning early on that 
when Laertes was very young, he found his mother dead in her room. Um, and so while he isn't responsible for this action, he feels like incredible guilt over this. Um, he found her when he was seven. Oof. Yeah, I mean, awful, awful stuff. Um, and his father's reaction to it was like typical, disgusting, like, he Therapy. he got yelled at for crying over this um Ugh. and so like this reaction from his dad and just him feeling this guilt over it and the fact that he couldn't save her like it's traumatizing to him and throughout the whole story like he is actually haunted by her he sees visions of her um kind of in the same way that hamlet is haunted by his um his own father in the original story um laertes sees his mom in his dreams in real life in the same outfit that she died in and that he found her in and then more stuff too kind of plays on his um, grief. Like early in the novel, Laertes' friend group is introduced to a girl named Josephine. Um, and she's dating one of the roommates, Henry. Um, and her and Laertes end up having sex behind Henry's back um, because Josephine lies to him and tells him that they've broken up when they have it. Um, and it causes a huge disruption in between him and his friends. And Laertes feels very um, isolated from them during this time because they are rip roaring pissed at him as they should be, even though yeah. Josephine lied to him. Like, you know, in a way he's still kind of like broke bro code. If that's a thing, like he shouldn't have done it anyway. It was kind of shitty of him to do, but it is what it is. Causes a big thing. So you have these all things going on while Ophelia is pursuing a relationship with Hamlet, which he does not approve of. Um, because he feels so protective over his sister and thinks that Hamlet is trying to be with her as like some sort of revenge for um, the way that he's been acting at court lately. Um, you learn pretty early on that um, Laertes is like, he's described as a rake um, by all of court. Like he, you know, he likes to flirt with girls. He takes a lot of women home. Like he just doesn't have a very good reputation. And so it kind of, because he's such good friends with Hamlet makes Hamlet look bad. And so Hamlet think or Laertes thinks that Hamlet's doing this to Ophelia to get back at him for that. And so he doesn't want Ophelia being like a pawn to Hamlet and wants to keep her away mm. from him. Fair enough. Yeah. So by the time Ophelia has gone mad herself and died, like all this stuff's piled on Laertes. He's destroyed. Like he's been through so much with, you know, the death of his dad, his own madness, his friends abandoning him. And then, you know, going through this fight. And then Hamlet's been his friend his entire life. Like you, we get like little flashbacks throughout the book of him being childhood friends with him, spending all this time with him, getting to know him, being really close. So he feels like incredibly betrayed by what he has done. Um, and so he, you know, and he feels like, you know, Hamlet's killed his whole family and left him alone. And so it's really easy to see from this perspective why Laertes would immediately jump to like, I'm going to kill Hamlet and I'm not going to have any remorse about it because he's lost everything at this point. And I want to kind of briefly touch on the relationship between Hamlet and Laertes because it is very queer coded. Yes. yes. <laughs> Which I love, but I also don't because it doesn't expand the way that I kind of wanted it to. Um, there's Ooh. like little scenes. There yeah, there's little scenes where you get like weird intimate moments. There's a part really early where Hamlet lights a cigarette and Laertes lights his own off the end of it. Oh my god, that's the gayest possible fucking yeah. way of life. I know, right? When I, when I had my notes, I was like, just kiss. Like, come on. They do that in Interview with the Vampire, and it's the literal gay... They have gay sex on screen that is less homoerotic than that scene where they <laughs> exactly. light a cigarette off of another man's cigarette. I think I've seen a gif of it on Tumblr, what you're talking about. Oh, I need about, to Keelan. see this. Yeah, I remember watching it just being like, and I just stared for like yes. three minutes. That's solid. my reaction every time I see a gif from this show. They just make there. the most intense eye contact while they do it. I'm like, can you just fucking stick your tongues down each other's throats instead? That would be less gay than whatever is happening right now. <laughs> yeah, so like the whole, like I said, all their interactions are kind of like this. It's kind of, like I said, I wish it had went on a little bit more, um, especially because their reaction, or I'm sorry, the relationship between Laertes and Hamlet reminds me so much of Paul and Julian in these violent delights. Oh, 
Yeah. And so I was like, kept expecting it to kind of go along this route and it never did. I wrote in my review that this book would have been so much better if they had kissed while they lay dying. <laughs> like, this would have made it so much better. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And so um, I felt like it would have explored Laertes' feelings of betrayal in a unique way. Um, like, you could build on top of that. Like, he's also like in a, this romantic relationship and it never kind of went anywhere. But, you know, it's what it is. It didn't like make the book bad. I just felt like. It could have been explored and it wasn't. Another thing, I really loved this book's take on revenge as a whole. So early on in the book, Laertes is studying and comes across a passage about virtue, um, which the textbook says requires wisdom, temperance, and justice. And he actually kind of, he writes in the margins of his textbook whether there's limits of vengeance in accordance with justice. Um, and I think that's like so powerful. Like, can vengeance reach a high point? at all if you're getting justice on someone who wronged you um and if it can like what's the line when do you know you've crossed it like in like the thrall of Laertes anger at the end of this book when he is almost ready to kill Hamlet like he is still questioning himself he asks himself whether you know if he's sure if this is the right path to go down despite all the harm that Hamlet has caused him either directly or indirectly. And I think that we've all been in a position where we wanted revenge. You know, maybe you did it, maybe you didn't do it, but there's always a time where you stop and think like, hey, maybe this isn't the right path. And so this moral dilemma that Laertes faces is a powerful one. You know, he's ready to take another human life. And so He says, quote, killing Hamlet was the only way I could see toward becoming my father's son in truth and requiting the, and requiting the villain for Ophelia's breakdown. If the system of justice wouldn't do it, then I would. Mm, Go off. Yeah. And so it directly goes back to what he mentioned before about being vengeance directly tied to justice. But again, you have to ask yourself, like, what's the line? Like, where can you stop? You know, like, is taking his life Is it really going to get justice? You have to kind of think about that kind of thing. And so when Laertes finally makes his decision uh, to kill him, like he ends up regretting it to a degree. um, And he thinks to himself, quote, it was never enough. And he's, you know, referring to like, even though he accomplished what he wanted, um, it didn't bring his family back. And um, it didn't right any past wrongdoings. And now he's also dying because In the brawl of, you know, when in the heat of this moment, like Hamlet cuts him with the blade that has the poison on it. And so um, I love the way that his regret is phrased in this book, um, because it's that Laertes says that he doesn't regret killing the part of Hamlet that ruined his life. He only regrets killing the masks that Hamlet wore that he loved so deeply. And it's like, he had all of these parts of Hamlet that he kind of put in these boxes. And he feels no remorse for killing, you know, the part that hurt him over the years. That, you know, that uh betrayed him and killed his dad that led to Ophelia's death but there's all these parts that he did love about him and those things are gone now because of this decision that he made I don't know I just thought it was like is is powerful it was like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and so when they're laying there together dying from what they did to each other they both end up forgiving the other person for what they've done and it was just like the best ending to like a book that ends with everyone literally dying like you know it kind of feels like sometimes when you have books like that it just feels so unsatisfying because it's just like really but it didn't do that with this didn't happen with this book i really appreciated that the only thing that would have made it better is gay sex yeah they could have yeah. kissed as they were lighting each other's blood like come on that's all i've yeah, ever everything wanted everything can be marginally improved by gay sex but well, exactly. honestly but it is what it is um For my final point, I just want to say, um, in the author's note, she, um, the author Carly states that she's always found Laertes to be a criminally misunderstood character. I think this book does a really fantastic job at telling his story and making one up and applying it to the, the stuff that we already know. And on top of that, like the prose of this book is beautiful. In the blurb for this book, it says for fans of If We Were Villains, it's because of the prose of this book. 
gorgeous stuff was written in here. And um, this book was fairly short. It was really actually more of a novella. It was under 200 pages, but it was not sold short. You get a amazing ride from start to finish. It's not, I don't know, the writing is just gorgeous. And even if you don't know anything about Hamlet, if you're not a Shakespeare girly, whatever, I would recommend it just because of the story that it tells. I'm like, you know, I don't often want to sit and read my books and like learn something or have like a moral question asked to me, but I really, really enjoyed this. And it brings to light a lot of the things I think about, you know, even from like, you know, I live in America, I have to think about awful things all the time. So it just makes you like think about other awful things. Yeah, you know, like, I know choices I've made in my own life about revenge and justice and vengeance and all that kind of stuff just makes you think and I loved it. I mean, I know we've had like some up and downs with our book choices that we've received. Mine was a real winner. I'm so happy. I'm the one who picked it for you. I had a good time. Like, when I first got it, I was almost disappointed because it was so short. Um, And I was like, man, I wish wish it was longer. But you know, it, it exceeded all of my expectations. The writing was beautiful. Yay, that's awesome. I found it on a Dark Academia list, obviously. But like those are always hit or miss. And it was the first time I saw this one specifically on a list like this. Like The other books in the list were stuff like The Atlas Six that I Ugh. know you're not a big fan of. So. Oh my god, I hate The Atlas Six. <laughs> yeah, but I saw Hamlet retelling and I was like, huh, that sounds like something Kristen would love. Yeah, it was, um, I didn't know a lot about Hamlet going in. I had read it before, but I had to kind of refresh my memory on it before I went in. And um, you can tell that this author really, really understands the story. Um, In fact, in the author's note, she even says that she taught um, a class on Hamlet for like 15 years. Oh, damn, that makes sense. Oh, wow. Yeah, Yeah, so like she knows her stuff and it's very, very clear. It's the kind of perspective, like, on a character that you can really only get from being an obsessed academic, and I really appreciate <laughs> yes, that. Yes, I love that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, no matter that I did not really particularly like my book, this was the nerdy episode, and I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was definitely, like, taking these little niche things that, like, me and Lady love and putting yes. them in a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have to do this again because this was really fun. Oh yeah, it was really fun. I really, yeah. I liked not having to like think about what I was yes. gonna do. Someone just told yes. me, and it was great. <laughs> yes. Did we have a game? So, I thought of this today during while I was making my dinner, and I just thought this would be so much fun. Okay, so earlier today, I had each of you send me a book that you either liked or disliked, and I'm let me I'm gonna paint you a scene. Okay. I'm scared. I am so scared. The book that I sent Chris and I absolutely fucking hate. <laughs> I think I think we all did that. I think we all said her books we hate. Okay, so l- let me paint you a picture. Like, what is happening? <laughs> you're standing in Barnes & Noble, and you're looking at the shelves. And a girl comes up beside you. She picks up a book, and she starts reading the back cover. It's a book that you've read before, and you have some pretty strong feelings about In 30 seconds or less, you need to convince this girl why or why not she should buy that book and read it. And it's the book that you told me. Oh, my God. Oh. My time has come. So let me um, get a timer. And whoever wants to go first can go first. I don't really care, but I am going to time you and you only have 30 seconds. And I will cut you off. Yeah, I just have to pull up the book because as I told you, I have no idea what the author's name is. I hated this book so much. Yeah, I the book that she, the book that Caitlin gave me, I was I was staying with her when she read it. All right. I guess I'll start. Okay, are you ready? Yes. The book that I that I sent to Kristen by the way is Blood of Elves by Andrei Sapkowski, the first Witcher book. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to count you down. You have 30 seconds to convince this girl at the Barnes and Noble why she should or should not pick this book up. Are you ready? Yes. 3 Two, one, go. Okay, I know you've seen the series, or you have played the game, and they are amazing. They're both amazing, I know. It looks super cool. This book has a full-ass chapter where a character is training, and the only the, the whole chapter is written in dialogue. It's only parry, strike, parry, strike for three pages. You do not want to read this. You will be bored. <laughs> That's Sorry. it. I don't even need 30 seconds. You're joking. 
You're fucking joking. I don't even need 30 seconds. That's it. There's a whole last <laughs> chapter about combat session and she's only like, it's only dialogue. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I would definitely not pick it up after hearing that. Can you believe all these great things come from this book? I can't. <laughs> God. All right. I'm ready. Okay. So the book that I gave Kristen is the second book in a series. It's a book that I can't believe I let happen to me. I can't believe I did not <laughs> DNF it. It is Slow Burn by Kristen Ashley. Okay. You ready? Yep. Three, two, one, go. The phrase lip touch is used to refer to a kiss multiple times. Uh, milk that cock is used unironically <laughs> during multiple sex scenes. Um, nothing happens for the entirety of the book. And uh, they do some of the worst role play possibly ever. Literally, they just do uh, handcuffs and act like sexy fugitives. Time. <laughs> There's an advantage to me speaking very, very fast. Uh, honestly, you have got me at lip touch, so... Yeah, same. <laughs> I had the page open, but I didn't have the quote highlighted. There's a quote that I, on this page, just so you guys can understand. I don't know what she was doing. I can't remember. But he says, thought you were going to suck my finger down your throat. I don't know what... Um, the okay. Yeah. Mm. In no way is that, like... It's not sexy. Every bit of dialogue in this book is cringy and awful. Oh, gross. B, take your whack at it. <laughs> um, I didn't pick a book I hated, uh, but I also like struggled to pick a book that I didn't want to necessarily talk about. Anyway, so get ready to judge me. Uh, but I said I would talk about, I guess I'm going to try and elevator pitch, convince a person to read uh, The Selection by Kira Cass. Okay. Three. Two, one, go. Oh, hey, like that's pretty cool that this book from 2012 is on the bookshelf right now, <laughs> but maybe it's because of this new movie option coming out for it. But uh, I don't know. It was a good series. Uh, if you like The Hunger Games, it'll definitely like remind you of this kind of the dystopian, like what happens with the, you know, collapse of capitalism, you know. Um, but it, hey, it's an easy read. It's pretty quick and you might enjoy it. And, and, uh, the characters have pretty good dialogue back and forth, and, and I hope you enjoy it. Time. That was good. <laughs> that was fun. I'm glad that we had one positive one. <laughs> I just remember I read this, like, it's really easy to read young adult fiction, and I read it in a really big reading slump, and it was just interesting enough. Like, it definitely wasn't Hunger Games. It wasn't, like, pulling me in, but I was like, oh, I'll keep going. Yeah, hey, I forgot to mention, can you imagine the book that I read for today, The Bees? It was blurbed as for fans of The Hunger Games. Yeah, why? Um, what? I have no idea. I guess the, the kind of like crazy brutality, killing all of the male like bees or whatever. I have no idea. That, that's not all Hunger Games is about. I don't, I don't get it. So weird. I mean, maybe it's just that anything that seems kind of like... Violent as Hunger Games. Or like, or, or to like trying to violent overthrow. Yeah. To be fair, it was The Handmaid's Tale meets Hunger Games, but like, I don't really see the Hunger Games at all, so. Yeah. What was the last name of that, uh, the author who wrote Slow Burn? Ashley. Kristen Ashley. Giving Kristen's Everywhere a bad name. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I really can't believe I read both of those books. I can't believe you did either. I kept telling you to put it down and you just refused. I think it's because I spent money on it. I couldn't bring myself to let it go. Well, sometimes you just gotta... Sometimes you have to draw the line. Yeah, you do. I don't have a line. I don't have a line, though. No, I'm stubborn as fucks, too, so no. My, yeah. my line was apparently light lark. <laughs> yeah. That's a good place to draw the line. <laughs> yeah. I draw the line at star sticks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. That's... Still makes me so angry. <laughs> I don't want to put Light Lark on the list of books that we mentioned. I'm cutting it out. We're cutting it out. Okay. We can't bring it up again. Okay. I'd say once once is enough. No. You put it on the list and I'll I'll cut it from the list if I need to. Okay. So we will be back to our regular book format next episode. Um, we'll be picking books and keeping them a secret from each other. We're definitely going to have to do this book secret santa basically for each other again because i i really really enjoyed it 
Yes, it was awesome. So our next episode um, will be out April the 25th. But in the meantime, you can find us at Red in the Dark Pod on Instagram and Tumblr. Um, our email is redinthedarkpod at gmail.com. If you want to ask a question about any of the books we discussed on this episode, we also have a book club. You can find us at Warren Page Library on Instagram and Tumblr, which will have details on how to join our Discord. Finally, we are hosting some challenges on Storygraph through the book club, which you can find by searching Warren Page Library's Book of the Month and Warren Page Library's 23 for 2023 in the challenges section of the app. Leite's book was The Bees by Laleen Paul. And then my book was Laertes by Carly Stevens. Uh, at the beginning, the books that we used to describe us was How the King of Elfame Learned to Hate Stories by Holly Black. Alice by Patrick Sinecal, Feast of Sparks by Sierra Simone, The Cruel Prince by Holly Black, The Darkest Part of the Forest by Holly Black, The Dark Queen by Susan Carroll, The Heiress Gets a Duke by Harper St. George, If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio, A Deal with the Elf King by Elise Kova, The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern, A Natural History of Dragons by Marie Brennan, Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer, and The Prince Gambit by C.S. Picot. Other books that was mentioned were A Court of Wings and Ruin by Sarah J. Mass, Blood of Elves by Andrei Sepkowski, The Atlas Six by Olive E. Blake, Strange the Dreamer by Leonie Taylor, These Violent Delights by Mika Niemerever, Slow Burn by Kristen Ashley, and unfortunately, Light Lark by Alex Astor. <laughs> Keep reading and we'll see y'all next time. Bye. 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 Bye.